So let me introduce Bishop Marzio, who's a, uh, I must say that the one, the one constant in my career um, on immigration has been that uh, has been Bishop DiMarzio. I've always I've always worked for him wherever I, wherever I went. Either that, or I've worked at agencies that he's created, or boards, you know, agencies uh, where he's the chair board or whatever chair of the board. And I and I must say, you know, it's been a it's been a delight, and I've learned a lot from him, and I consider him a, a terrific mentor and just rock solid kind of inspiring leader on these issues. So let me talk. He's a, he's a leader in, I think, four ways. One, he's a leader in the church. And let me just read some of the associations that he's had and positions he's had. He's been a member of the Vatican's Pontifical Council on the Pastoral Care for Migrants and Itinerant People, which I think is named something different now. Past chairman of the uh, Bishop's Migration Committee, founder of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, and chair of our board of directors. He's been on the Catholic Relief Services Board, He's been on the Catholic University of America board. He's been on uh, the Cathedral Healthcare Systems board. He's been the chair of the Center for Migration Studies, which is the host of, one of the hosts of this gathering, and still is. So he's a huge, a huge kind of force, and he's also, I should say, the bishop of the uh, what they call the Diocese of Immigrants, which is the Bishop of Brooklyn. Second. People may not know this in the Catholic world, but he's a real leader nationally and internationally. Uh, he was the, you know, for example, is the board chair of Migration Policy Institute, a big think tank in Washington, D.C. on these issues. And he was also the sole U.S. representative to the Global Commission on International Migration, which, was, which gave us this uh, migration and development dialogue, which we've had at the U.N. level for, for many years now. The third thing that I wanted to stress is he's also an expert on these issues. He's a scholar. He did his, um, his doctoral work on these issues. And he's written extensively on them. Um, and beyond that, he started his career, I think, in immigration. Well, he probably started it in his, in his own family, actually. But as a parish priest, he was an accredited representative that was actually directly representing people. So this is the, uh, Bishop DiMarzio is the real deal. He's, uh, he's been a great person to work with and a great champion, and I, and I couldn't be more delighted that he's, been, that he's agreed to join us here today. So thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Don, and uh, I want to thank a few people today. I guess Father Matthew Didone, who's the provincial for the Scalabrinians, and Father Ezio Marchetta, who is our host today here at the uh, uh, Holy Family Church, which uh, belongs to the Scalabridians here in Washington. Uh, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Center for Migration Studies in New York, and Don now is our executive director. It's really a think tank for educational issues on migration. We publish the International Migration Review, and uh, do a lot of research in this area. And today is one of those days where we're working on the whole issue of immigrant integration. This is part of developing the final uh, paper that will help us, I think, understand better how the church can be a real instrument in the integration of immigrants and refugees in our country. As we look uh, to probably a little exchange after this, we recognize that uh, this is an issue that has been with the United States ever since we have become an immigrant country from the very beginning. But it's not something we've done very well with. We've struggled back and forth. It seems that there have been periods when we want to exclude immigrants. We can see that from our own history of 1924 on to now when we're struggling to how to integrate immigrants who are here without documents. It's, it's been really a a nettlesome issue for we who are Americans, and who are Americans, that's real, really the issue. Uh, it was a famous statement that America belongs as much as the to the immigrant who came yesterday as to the people who came on the Mayflower. This is a self-generating country. We, we all belong here when we invest our lives and we work here. We look to uh, immigration and integration as part of a, a broader process as Catholics of communion. Uh, culture plays a prominent role in our thinking, and uh, 
Culture is the learn is learned in the process of socialization. One of the, the great thinkers uh, for the church in this area was Father Joe Fitzpatrick, a, a Jesuit who taught at Fordham University. And this, this book is probably the Bible, I would say, of the cultural diversity issue and integration. It's called One Church, Many Cultures. And it begins again, as one of our speakers already spoke, about the Acts of the Apostles. The church at the very beginning was multicultural and struggled. How do we integrate uh, the Greeks and the Hebrews? And then it went on as the church became the great missionary church that it is. How do we integrate all of these peoples into one church? Uh, it's clearly not an easy thing to do. But the church has done it in many ways. And there have been failures that we can, as Father Fitzpatrick said there, we have the greatest failure perhaps was not recognizing when the Jesuits went to China that we could evangelize the Chinese if we understood their culture better. We saw the church pull back from that and lost that great evangelization possibility many centuries ago to evangelize China. Clearly, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons, uh, but we keep unlearning them too. How do we see the United States as a melting pot or a, a stew or uh, a mosaic? Uh, really, we see a lot of conflicts still happening. It's not finished, and migration really is not a problem to be solved, but rather something we must naturally grow into understanding ourselves better. By contrast, we can see culture as a repository for people's deepest aspirations and values. And we see migration which brings together many peoples in one land that with diverse cultures. Uh, our cult church has been one that has, with struggle, unified many cultures. We've seen this, this unity based on faith uh, with many different struggles over the years. But the immigration perhaps presented the church with an opportunity to build communion between culturally diverse peoples, both natives and newcomers. It was not easy, and it's not complete. But we've learned a lot over these two centuries that we have been an immigrant church in the United States. We see that integration is not just a matter of assimilation into the dominant U.S. culture or even our Catholic culture, but it has its own distinctive changes. Rather, we look to draw from the gifts and the strengths and the contributions that all the cultures bring us. And really, it is acculturation, which perhaps is the best word that we can use as culturally sensitive people to understand how we integrate people into this one culture of the United States, into the culture of our church here. Father Fitzpatrick once used this definition of the principle of effective acculturation. He says, people integrate from a position of strength. In order for people to give their best, they need a sense of safety and security, a sense of belonging, a sense of esteem. Structure needs to facilitate the meeting of these needs. The structure of our church truly has to facilitate people feeling welcome and being able to contribute what they are. Pope Francis recently said it this way, migrants and refugees do not represent a problem to be solved, but they are our brothers and sisters to be welcomed, respected and loved. They are an occasion that providence gives us to build up a more just society, a more perfect democracy, a more united country, a more fraternal world, and a more open and evangelical Christian community. I think uh, Pope Francis showed that on the trip he took to uh, the island off of Sicily, where he was there to welcome immigrants and refugees, unfortunately to also bury many who had died in, uh, in that voyage across the, the Mediterranean. Uh, it's not an easy thing we deal with today. The immigration is a source of conflict. But today we're looking at how the vision of our Catholic institutions, in partnership with even other non-Catholic institutions, can contribute 
to the integration of immigrants in our country. We have to make an important point. What is essential about how we view integration? Institutions do not integrate immigrants. They can facilitate it, but immigrants integrate, not institutions. And Catholic institutions cannot effectively contribute to immigrant integration if they lose sight of the agency of the immigrants themselves and do not model themselves on openness and inclusion. My own work, and there's a lot of scholarly work, but I want to speak a little bit about my own experience as the grandchildren, grandson of immigrants. My, all my grandparents came from Italy. My mother and father were born here. Well, we lived in, a, in North New Jersey, basically an Italian ghetto in many ways. But the church we went to was the Irish church, and it was not easy to integrate into the Irish church. My grandparents never went to church since they spoke Italian, and there wasn't any place for them in the Irish church. But I went to the Catholic school, and I was integrated. Uh, many times, one of the sisters who was a little bit off said, well, I was one of those dirty, rotten Italian Catholics who, uh, and that was true, I, I, didn't, I don't forget that phrase as long as I live. But this was the cultural insensitivity that we faced. Uh, we were the Italians and the rest of them were the Minigani, which meant the Americans. There was us and them. There was no other groups. The, the Latinos today call us the gringos. But it's an understanding of when a group feels put upon, all they can do is strengthen themselves, uh, isolate themselves because there's other people out to get them. So we have to understand that dynamic that happens uh, and time and time again, and we haven't learned perhaps all the lessons we should have. As I, I lived in that immigrant family, I lived with my grandparents, I learned Italian dialect as a child, and when I went to school, there were many things I didn't know the American word for. In those days, we were not too high tech, but you, you got a card with pictures on it, and you had to say what it was. I'll never forget, they showed the picture of a potato, and you had to say potato, but I didn't know the word in English, I said patata. And uh, all the other kids laughed, and I didn't laugh, because I didn't like that. I felt really isolated. But I learned English pretty well uh, with time. But I think you have to, to see how the immigrant themselves feels excluded, not included in many, many ways, sometimes not consciously. But we certainly know, have to learn how we consciously can immigrate the immigrants into our society. As we look uh, to these integrators, indicators of ecclesial integration, I, I drew a parallel between, and I can't remember the book I, I read, where there were eight variables of social integration. And I wrote a paper once in, uh, to, uh, paralleling them with, uh, with the indicators of ecclesial integration. And the integration factors were labor force participation, and then well, how about people going to mass? Language acquisition, well, attendance at non-language uh, non, non masses, English masses. That would be one ind indicator of integration. There was educational continuance, where people then would go to religious education. Military service could be uh, vocations to the priesthood and religious life. I'll never forget, I was about five years old, and my grandfather was in the yard, and I was there, and a priest came by and started to talk to my grandfather. I was amazed, because I'd never seen somebody who could speak Italian that was a priest. And from that moment on, I was five years old, I said, maybe I can be a priest too. Because I always wanted to be a priest, even when I was a little kid. But that, that never left me, that, that vision that my grandfather could talk to a priest, though he never went to church, and somebody was interested in him. That made me interested in immigration from that time on. Also, if you look at these other, these other um, indicators, naturalization rates, parish membership, voting, pastoral council participation, home ownership, personal parishes where people have their own parishes, and intermarriage, which is probably the highest level of integration, and this happens over time, we know. Truly, uh, my diocese of Brooklyn is called the Diocese of Immigrants because over half of the population of 
uh, two, eight million people is are immigrants, and more, more than half of the Catholic population are immigrants. Yesterday I celebrated uh, Mass for the Nigerian immigrants. They celebrate each year the, the feast of the flight into Egypt, which gives them an opportunity to understand. They themselves, as immigrants, they relate to the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt. And it was a great festivity, lasting a few hours. I had to leave close to the end to catch the train to come here. But clearly, they were integrated into this parish where there was at least three other language groups. I have one parish where there are five language groups. I call it the quintuplex. We have all the parishes are duplex, uh, but some of them are triplex, uh, quadruplex, quintuplex. That's the reality of the church today, at least in the highly uh, populated immigrant areas. Uh, the creation, uh, as we see, of the instruments of integration are truly important. One of the best instruments of integration that the church had in the United States is and was the Catholic schools. Recently, uh, Notre Dame University, which does a lot of good work, uh, came to our diocese and produced a study called Hispanic Prospects Exploratory, Quantitative Research Analysis of the Catholic Schools of the Diocese of Brooklyn. Because unfortunately, the Hispanic immigrant children are very much underrepresented in our school population. And what this Notre Dame committee did was do this study to tell us what are the factors that kept the Hispanics from rolling in our schools. The, the easiest one, yes, it costs money. Uh, but there were many other things we didn't realize that were keeping the Hispanics from even thinking of enrolling in our schools. First of all, they thought it cost much more money than it does. They were afraid that their children wouldn't have good food to eat at lunch because they were interested in eating their own food. Uh, and many other factors that were really a surprise. And uh, the biggest surprise, perhaps, was the group that we had to work at to get them to come to the Catholic schools were those who were the least acculturated because the newest immigrants were the ones most likely to put their children in Catholic schools, make the sacrifice of paying uh, the tuition, because the others who were here longer perhaps saw less value in continuing the practice of their Catholic faith. Now we have a, we've had a program right along for uh, Hispanics and special scholarships for them, so we're working on that. And that, that was something we learned uh, over the last uh, two years when that study was, was done. The report that the Center for Migration Studies is drafting on Catholic institutions and integration asks really this question, is the church rising to the challenge today? The church has really been up and down in this. There was a period of time when we kind of forgot we were an immigrant church. But with the change in the immigration law in the 60s, we became clearly an immigrant church again, much more than we were even at the beginning. With so many different groups, and the variety was probably the greatest challenge for us. It wasn't just European groups, but now we're, we were welcoming South Americans, Asians, Africans, the church be, truly became a, uh, an example of the New Pentecost, where people from all these cultures and languages came together. Um, so we're looking to see how the church can still play a mediating role in, as it formerly played for, for integrating the immigrants. In the past, we had, as we talked a little bit before, about national parishes. Every, church, every group wanted to have its own church, because then they felt strong. They integrated from a position of strength, not weakness. That's a principle that uh, uh, Father Fitzpatrick always taught. And he taught uh, the two Tomasis, Archbishop Tomasi and Lydia Tomasi. He was their, their professor at Fordham. And he kept saying that all the time, when the immigrants feel strong, they will integrate. If, you, if they don't feel strong, if they don't feel welcome, they're going to stay to the side. So this is the difficulty today is we can't have a parish for every group. But I have, like in my diocese, they share one parish, five, six uh, groups sometimes in a parish. Sometimes they have mass once a month. Sometimes it's every week. We have upstairs, downstairs, different times. Uh, the parishes know how to welcome in, in this situation. And uh, then it gives them, again, the integration effect. 
One of the best events we have every year in our diocese is what we call the migration uh, dinner. In fact, we have to have two of them because we can't find a place big enough to accommodate everybody. And each immigrant group nominates someone they call the shining star, something that has helped that group. Now we're dealing with 30 groups uh, in the diocese, so we have to have two dinners, and everybody gets a chance to say, this is the person that's helped our community most over the last year. We give them a nice shining star. And uh, it is the, the best that I uh, go to every year because it shows how the integration happens. The best thing they do together is dance. Everybody dances together. And uh, there is this, I think, sense of solidarity that we, we bring everybody together. It's one church, uh, different aspects, different cultures, but uh, Catholicism does have the ability to bring diverse people together. So as we look uh, to our work today, we try to figure out how we can make the church still to be a mediating structure in the integration of immigrants. Integration, again, meaning that people keep their own culture, their own, their own identity. We don't want them to lose that. But still, we have to, to be clear on how we can facilitate that work. And again, if they feel welcomed, if they feel strong, we will accomplish our task. Over the years, again, I mentioned the school study uh, that uh, allowed us to understand better ourselves and to see how we can get the new immigrants into our schools. We need, obviously, to have ESL as one of the, the components. Now, in the past, uh, when I went to school, my first translation job came in the second grade. A little boy came from Italy, and I, again, spoke enough dialect so they sat me next to him, and every time something was happening, I had explained to him what was going on. Well, he, it was okay for about a year. Then he was okay. He didn't want to even talk to me anymore. I was, uh, I was the crutch. He wanted to get rid of that crutch. He wanted to be on his own. And uh, that was our ESL class in, in 1950. Uh, so things have changed. Now we're more sophisticated. We have bilingual education. We have ESL. But still, the idea of welcome is what's important. That's truly important that we, we look at uh, this uh, idea of, of bringing all the people together. In the Notre Dame report, they came up with an interesting uh, concept which uh, does work. They, they told us that in order to increase the enrollment of Latino children in our Catholic schools, we needed to have madrinas, uh, madrinas, padrinas, godfathers, godmothers, if we could find people in the community that had their children in the school, they were the best recruiters. They were the links. They could tell uh, the, the, the Hispanic parents uh, that it was okay to come to the school. They respected us. They, they would take care of us. And that's what we've been doing. We've been uh, training our madrinas, especially, to go out of the community and recruit uh, students for our schools. We have seats. We have tuition assistance, we just need the children to come. And, it, and it's working, and we thank Notre Dame for providing that service for us. But the schools don't do it alone. The Catholic Immigration Integration Project, which is what we're working on today, uh, helps us understand all of the mediating structures that the church has that can indeed effectuate a true integration without people losing their own identity. The church has cradled the great ministries in many, many ways in our, in, our, in our country. But we also need pastoral education, uh, charitable, legal, many services so that immigrants uh, can feel welcome into our diocese. Obviously, uh, Don was uh, the, the past uh, director of clinic, and today we have the new director here. And something I started when I went to USCCB. We know we needed legal services to help our immigrants, and now Almost all the dioceses in our country, where there are immigrants, participate, and we help them do this basic outreach where people can't gain legal status, but they can bring their relatives from overseas to join them. It was a great service we have, and we do that as a united uh, front in our Catholic Conference. But there are many other things that we still could do to make sure that our integration is even more effective. Uh, we, we look at the church's work, and it's never-ending. 
as we look to our, our country today, uh, the issue of immigration is not a new one, but it seems like every generation facing it forgets the lessons of the past. We need to relearn them and not forget what we've learned and what we struggled to. As we look ahead, uh, let me end with the thought on, on the past. The book of Revelation tells us there's nothing new under the sun. That's really Ecclesiastes. But uh, <laughs> that does not mean that we remember everything that ever happened under the sun. Virtually all of the Catholic Church's signature institutions in the United States arose in a response to the needs of earlier generations of immigrants, our, our schools, our hospitals, our social services. And one of the goals of the project that we're engaging in is to uh, look and see what we can learn from the past and apply it to the future. I'm thinking of the example of a, a network of labor schools and ministries that focused on the workplace in the middle decades of the 20th century. In fact, they persisted up into the 1970s because my brother, who was an attorney, actually taught in one of these labor schools, which the Jesuits had in Jersey City, New Jersey. So that kind of a thing was really looking at the needs of workers, trying to give them an understanding of how they could organize themselves and how they could integrate. So immigrants come to this country to work. That's, that's clearly the case. That's why we don't understand the undocumented. That's why they come here. They come to work. Not to go on welfare, not to be a burden, but to work. And once we could understand that as a nation, I think that would be much easier and much uh, quicker to integrate them and give them legal status. Overall, our project today, uh, we want to look at the church uh, of the century ago when 75% of the Catholics came from six national groups. Uh, they always didn't get along with one another. But today I think we've learned better how we can get along with one another and how we can integrate them better than we ever have. And so, as the, the bishops put it, not uh, so long ago in one of their statements in the year 2000, a century ago, the church responded generously to the needs of immigrants, building parishes and schools, establishing a vast array of charitable institutions, evangelizing newcomers, and being evangelized in turn by immigrant Catholics with distinctive traditions of worship and often a deep spirituality much their own. We need to do that again. Uh, we need to understand what, what did happen and how we can replicate it today. That's our challenge. It's a very hopeful sign that you've come here today, committed yourselves to this challenge and moving us ahead. Please continue to help us with this very important project. God bless you. Take any questions? Yes. I'm uh, Father Rick Riscavage from Turkey University, Professor of Sociology and International Studies. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I, I want to echo Don's uh, point. Uh, I, I learned a great deal when I worked for you, and, it's, and a lot of that is still in my mind, even as I continue my life. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. I just want to ask one question. In your neighboring diocese at Rockville Center, uh, Bishop Murphy uh, allowed us to conduct, we're, we're in the process of conducting some research on parishes, on the, on the hot button issue of immigration. And we're doing kind of focus groups within the parish structure of uh, very, you know, newcomers, old comers, various age groups and things like that. And what we're discovering as we go through this is uh, what Professor Ed said about power relations within the parish structure. It's starting to become very evident to us that uh, this whole idea of one part of the parish seeing itself as very welcoming, you know, we really, you know, we don't have any anti-immigrant feelings or anything, but in fact, in what surfaces is that very same power thing of the dominant people thinking they're welcoming, but when you talk to the immigrants, they, they don't feel welcome that much, and they, they're afraid to say it even sometimes, and so it's a kind of a, an, and I'm wondering, in a, in a diocese like yours, where they're mostly immigrants, I mean, a lot, it, does that same power thing happen in the parishes, or is it more controlled because there's so, such diversity? Well, uh, probably a little less than Rockville Center. Rockville Center, 
People come to Brooklyn, they move to Rockville Center, the better part of Long Island. We're still Long Island. We're the beginning of it. Probably, again, I think it's, it's a majority-minority situation. As I say, if I have a parish where there's five different language groups, well, really nobody dominates. Everybody kind of feels equal, and they get treated the same. Sometimes not well, but they all get treated the same. So they're, they're happy about that. Nobody's uh, above somebody else. Uh, I guess it is an issue of, of uh, the, the dominance of immigrants. Uh, when everybody's an immigrant, well, they start to realize, well, we better get along with one another. We don't have any choice. But I guess when there's a majority community, a minority community becomes a little different. You know, what am I going to allow these people to do? And when are they ever going to learn English? Why do they want their own mass and their own uh, cultural uh, festivities, etc.? So that has always been a problem in, in, in our church for, for the last uh, couple of hundred years. But it resolves itself. There's no solution, I don't think. It resolves itself over time. Uh, people do change. Uh, people integrate, at the same time they maintain their own cultural identity. So it is a process of change and uh, it depends where you are, I think, how, how difficult the situation is. Okay. Satisfied, good. <laughs>